and this might sound, I guess, a little counterintuitive, but I would probably tell myself to not look too far ahead. In 2018, I set some goals, and one of my goals was to make 20000 more than I did last year. 20000 seems like a big number, and I don't know, it's hard to digest. And I, although that was my 2018 goal, what I did is I just broke it down per month, and I said, I need to earn X amount per month in order to make this goal. I think I got to September or October. And I like, stopped, went back and looked at some invoices, and like, oh, I've already made what I made last year. And then so I only still have 20000 more before the end of the year in order to make. And then I, a couple months later, I, I got to said goal. What's going on? You're listening to episode 112 of the Perspective Podcast, and I'm your host, Scotty Russell of Perspective Collective. This show is fuel for your mind and creative grind. Each week, my guests and I provide the tools for thinking bigger, overcoming adversity, and making an impact with your work. At the end of each episode, I share a listener of the week, so stick around to figure out how you can get a shout out on a future episode in the show notes as well as in the newsletter. And Big shout out to my homie, Nick Jenkins of Bluka, who as of yesterday, the 22nd, just put out his latest EP of Foreign Objects. And if you've been bumping this show since the beginning, I've been just filling it all with Nick's groovy music. It fits the perfect vibe to this show. And if you want to go check it out, go find him on Spotify, SoundCloud, and then just connect with him on Instagram as he's always showing some behind the scenes work to his craft. That's at Bluka, B-L-O-O-K-A-H, and go check out his new music, show him some love, show him some support, and say that you heard it on the Perspective Podcast. Thanks, Nick. Quick announcement, today my beta creative coaching program officially launches. If you struggle with goal setting, finding time to grind and execute outside the day job, or maybe you need help with passion project advice, social media strategy, audience building tips, even if you have that big talk looming on the horizon, I can help you craft and deliver a killer talk that is sure to blow people's minds. If any of this sounds helpful, this targeted one-on-one session is for you. At 12 p.m. Central Time today, I will have a limited amount of five one-hour coaching sessions available for $100 a piece at p-ccoaching.com. The cost of future coaching sessions will increase when I open back up the program, so set your reminders and jump on this today. Again, this goes live at 12 p.m. Central Time at p-ccoaching.com. I'm absolutely stoked out of my gourd to personally work with you in 2019 to help you take your creative grind to the next level. All right. Social media is training us to compare our lives and catch up with others when really we're running our own race. The race we're all running isn't a sprint. It's a lifelong marathon. And the thing I realize more and more is that we all start at different times, we run at our own pace, and are all running towards different finish lines. The path we're on is our own. The highlights and successes come from the hard work we put in. The adversity we overcome propels us forward, helping us to grow. And in this race, you're going to be presented with opportunities, obstacles, and risk, and they all require you to act in the moment, but that's life. And as Tupac said... Keep your head up and handle it. Enough with the runaround and the silly running puns, and let's cue today's guest. We're lucky to have on art director, designer, and letterer running through the streets of Chicago, a day Hogue. A day's worked with brands like Under Armour, Nike, Mercedes Benz, and the Obama Foundation, to name a few, in his short tenure of full time freelancing. And he's a wizard when it comes to experimenting with different mediums like flowers, utilizing natural light, and using his style and voice to make an impact. In today's episode, we talked about the transition into full-time freelance and the lows that come with the highs. His pursuit to highlight black lettering artists, this section is awesome, especially if you're looking to discover some new talented people in this world. Uh, Next, we talk about acting in the moment instead of living with regret. Bouncing back from adversity and finding the silver lining, side projects, pizza, and running because pizza and running are related. Am I right? And whether you're a runner or not, this episode with the day is going to have plenty of ideas running through your head to act on. <laughs> now I'm really done with the running uh, running puns and wordplay. So you can find the show notes of this episode filled with everything we talk about and a ton of a day's work over at perspective-collective.com slash 112. Let me know what you think of this episode by taking a screenshot or video of you listening and tag me on Instagram stories so we can connect. As always, keep an open mind, take some notes, as I always love to see those as well. Let's go. (laughs) 
What's up, guys? We are live and chatting with one of the most talented artists, designers, and probably one of the most fittest creatives I know, Ade Hogue. Ade, welcome to the Perspective Podcast. How you doing, my dude? Uh, dude? I'm doing great, man. How about you? Good. And where are you just recently getting back from? You've been just traveling outside of the U.S. for a little bit. Yeah, man. I was in um, Costa Rica and Nassau, Costa Rica, and then in Tulum, Mexico for a wedding. So I vacationed the hell out of myself and I am much darker than than I was when I left. So. Extra tan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. For those who don't know, actually you and me, we linked up at what have been Creative South two years ago. Was that your first talk? No, it wasn't my first talk. Uh, okay. I did a conference talk. The, yeah, I think in the year before that. Uh, but I've done I've done a couple like smaller talks in between. But that one, comp, or, um, Creative South that year was the largest I had done up until that. And now you just did uh, Adobe Max, I believe, yeah. this last October, right? Yeah. Yeah, wild man, you're blowing up. I think Scott Beersack put you on my radar before Creative South and told me to look out for you. So I've been following you since. But for those who don't know, give us a brief Wikipedia summary page about yourself. Uh, just a, a little aside. One of my dreams is to to one day have a Wikipedia page. Like I think when you get a Wikipedia page, you've made it, right? And I I don't know how many designers out there actually have one, but that's my dream. Can't you just make one yourself and then just edit it as you go? You can, but they'll delete it. If it's oh. like not relevant, if like no no one cares about you, they will just remove it. I'm like bitch, so- I spoke at Adobe Max. <laughs> I want people to care enough about me that I get a a, a, a a Wikipedia page. But the quick Wikipedia entry for me is uh, I, I'm currently a artist, designer, creative, whatever, based in Chicago, Illinois. I was born in Virginia, raised in North Carolina. So I still like you'll hear a little southernness come out of my voice sometimes. I, I've worked at a couple agencies in the past. And then over the last two and a half years, I've been full time freelancing and kind of discovering my own path and creating my own journey which has been a funny, unique uh, experience. But I learned a lot through a lot of different things. There are a lot of different experiences that like have gotten me to where I am uh, today. As you said, I'm big into fitness, so a big runner, big cyclist, things like that, and try to stay in the gym. Try to, you know, try to keep off this uh, this dad body, which I know is coming. I'm not a dad yet, but, you know, I know it's going to come. I, so I got it. Close. I'm going to need your formula. <laughs> I'll need your routine here soon, man, because that dad bod is real. Oh, man. I'm scared of it. (laughs) Uh, Okay, let's touch on your backstory so we can go deeper into this. How did you, one, get into design, and then how did you discover lettering? And we'll go even more deep into the styles of lettering that you produce, more tactile, dimensional. And what are some of those previous jobs you had, maybe some of the shittier jobs or the agency jobs, and how that led to you finally taking the leap of full-time freelance? Because a lot of people want to just grind that side hustle and take it full-time themselves, and they like to hear how other people do it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the the design thing started for me as a little bit of a an accident. A lot of people, well, more people are knowing this as I've like given more talks and been on more podcasts, things like that. But I, I went to school originally for in, in civil engineering, and I spent about a year and a half, two years in that program before like realizing it wasn't for me. Um, I sort of stumbled into a couple of art classes. I was trying to just take classes to make sure I had enough credits uh, to stay a full time student because because like financial aid reasons. And I took a drawing class and I kind of liked it. Uh, I was really bad at it, but I still understood it. And it, it started to, to, to click. And then I did what everyone does. It's like, what is the kind of design that, or sorry, what is the kind of art that makes money, uh, which was graphic design. So I ended up taking graphic design classes. Start, I fell in love with it uh, genuinely. And everything just kind of clicked there. And so, yeah, that's how I got into design. The getting into lettering thing was a little different. It was in my first agency job. Um, I'd been there for about a year at that point and I got a little just stale from like the regular work things. It was a fine job and I had fun there, but I, I knew I like wanted something different. I wanted to like push it a little bit more creatively. Uh, so I started a 30 day lettering project and I just started lettering. I just did one word per day for 30 days. I know like I always look at Bob Ewing. Yeah. He's like the pinnacle of the example, you know, <laughs> he did that thing for like, hundreds of days he did like 550 days or something like that i know and i was like always oh, so amazed by it and i was like man i'm gonna do something like that and then i was like yeah 30 days is all i got 30 days is a lot itself that's a commitment and i know like 30 days to be able to have it so i, I just hung in there i was like 30 days i'll just do it and then once i started the 30 day thing I, I never really turned back it was kind of like a shift in the you know the instagram up until that point, I was like posting photos of fried chicken and like my favorite restaurants and that kind of stuff. That curation, that curation click, like this is what I want to show. This is what I want to known for and attract. Yep. And then it kind of shifted there and it never really turned back, I don't think. So I've been kind of doing lettering work ever since. And that was five years ago, I think. I think you posted your first lettering post not too long ago. 
that was horseshit. And that's a good thing because look where you are now. Like you're un- unbelievable. My first piece was absolutely terrible. So like, it's good to see how bad it was to see like that growth. I know, so man. People, people, it's good to get the shitty work out there. It really is. And it's really, I, I heavily encourage everyone to like, when they share those kind of early pieces to never delete them. Even like once you exactly. feel like you, I'm using air quotes here, you've made it. Like you, you want to be able to go back and look at them sometimes. And it's, it's humbling to like, go back and look where you started. Like, damn, this is really bad. It's like a, a visual journal yeah. you just documented. So yeah, I'm really glad you posted that yeah. first piece. <laughs> Yeah, it was a fun. It was a fun little assignment. It was a fun little um, way to keep me, make me accountable. Up, that, up until that point, I, I hadn't been with any kind of design, so that was uh, really necessary for me to give me something one day. So the personal, the personal project is what really kind of got your feet wet. Just starting a little side project. Yeah. Well, then, how did things go from that agency job? I'm taking it you were probably like a junior designer or something, entry level, Mm -hmm. and you bounced around there from another agency or so, or were you doing freelance on the side, and what led to you finally being like, screw it, I'm taking this full-time leap? Yeah, so that was the first agency job, and then I I did a a small contract gig kind of in between. Uh, That sort of got my feet wet, and this feeling of being self-employed, I'm using air quotes again there, too. Uh, I was on a contract, so I understood it, but it was my first time, like, buying my own health insurance and like doing all that kind of stuff like for myself. Um, and then I went into another agency experience that I stayed there for two years. That one was like invaluable to me. I learned so much there and I met so many good connections and friends to this day from that job. I, I still work with some of them, uh, still do projects with, with that agency every now and then too. So that was like a good experience. I needed that. I needed that camaraderie. I needed to like build a little bit more before taking the leap as people would say. Uh, I always joke around and say that I didn't take the leap. I took the stairs. I decided that I was going to leave that agency and they didn't want me to leave at that time. So they offered me the ability to stay on part-time. So to work 20 hours there, they just cut my salary in half. I could pursue my own thing on the, on the side. That's like perfect. (laughs) It was in theory, it was perfect in, in like practical, whatever usage it didn't really work out and it was just because i was still on the biggest account at that agency and they still demanded so much of me that it was hard to like it was hard to just turn off and turn on between like my personal work and then my agency work so it got into a point that i was getting super stressed and i was like dropping the ball on projects is because i needed to right i was i was only supposed to work there 20 hours a week when you have a normal full-time job to go over the 40 to go from 40 to 50 it's not that big of a deal because you know it's part of your job but for me when i was supposedly working 20 and then 20 became 30 that became really difficult for me because i knew i was then sacrificing my own time the stuff that i was trying to build outside of that so it it led to me not being able to like really sustain so i ended up fully leaving again which was good for me but i guess that was the the stairs uh it was like an extra little bit of time which i did technically have the the escalator (laughs) yeah which was good uh i loved it but yeah going into to the full-time freelancing it took a it was a big decision-making process. I had to think about it for a long time. I was so unsure about it. The question I kept asking myself was, if not now, when? I mean, there's no better time than now. Is what I always keep saying, too, is in, in these kind of moments where you have to decide where your life's going to go or what journey you're going to take or whatever, um, you have to see when is the best time to do it. And oftentimes, the best time to do it is when you're fully, like, you're really passionate about it in that moment. Uh, and I was, so I took some time. I, I thought about it. I tried to make a plan for myself. What I learned is that there was really no plan. I had so many friends of mine who are full-time freelancers like, yo, did you have this lined up or this lined up or this lined up? And so many of them were like, no, it's like, you know, you just feel overwhelmed by your other situations and it's just time to do it. And that's kind of how I felt when the time came. So did you have like student loans or anything? I still got those. Still, boys, you know? Okay. <laughs> oh, same here. I'm a lifer oh, probably. I, I was an idiot. But um, what about like a savings or anything like that? Were you just like, did you have connections lined up and projects and retainers already set? So I had a little bit of savings, not very much. It dried up like within four, I think like four months uh, of leaving of leaving the job. I didn't really have many projects, but I knew I had connections. I knew I still had that agency that I just left. The relationships yeah, are everything. Yeah, the relationships are big and uh, were super important for starting off as a full-time freelancer and going out on your own. So I knew I had relationships. I knew I had connections, but I didn't really have many projects. I had a couple small things from the very beginning, and I just kind of took it and ran. Uh, I had a little bit of a cushion, like I said, in my, my savings account, and it was just I, for a while I was just operating at like a total – deficit right i was just i was wasn't making nearly as much as i needed to actually sustain which is just taking it from the savings account taking it especially in chicago yeah 
what I appreciate too, especially like on Twitter, you're and why I wanted you on the show is you're very uh, open, transparent, and honest. Instead of portraying like this freelance life is glamorous and you know this this is what everybody should have, you actually speak of the difficulties or when like you know you having an off month or something like that. So like, why is it great at the same time? But what are some of the cons that people need to like be aware of to know like this is a lot harder than you know, it looks from the outside looking in. Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest con right there. It is much harder. I think the thing that I struggled with the most was leaving a full-time job and having so many friends. I was at an agency of 300 plus people and a lot of them were my age, right? So we became friends. So what happens as soon as you leave that job, every time you go out and meet with them for dinner or for drinks or whatever, they're just like, oh, I tell you, you're crushing it. Oh, you're doing this. Oh, you're doing so well. Uh, and that's something that's hard to reconcile because you know deep down that you might not be doing that great and maybe things are difficult in that moment um, and they don't understand that, they don't see that. So I wanted to become more open and honest with like the public and my following. I still was, at the beginning, I was kind of bad at it with the, with my actual friends, but then I got better at it. So when they were like, oh, you're doing really cool things this month, I was like, yes, but like, I haven't gotten paid 90 days from this project. And I started opening up about like the, the realizations of working for yourself uh, and not having a boss or not having people who can like go after money unless it's yourself. So I started opening up more with, with friends and open up more with the public. And then now I'm just kind of, I would like to say I'm an open book, but you know, there's not always. I think it's helpful, especially for like someone like me who always felt like I needed to do the freelance because everybody I respected was doing it as well. And like sometimes maybe having a day job is okay. You know, it gives you that consistency, especially if you have a family and then you just got to be more strategic with the hours you have in your day to hustle. Totally. And I mean, I have been one from the very beginning. People ask me like, Oh, we're going free time. Like if you always want to be a freelancer or do you think you do this forever? And I've always said that I'm not a hundred percent sure that I will do this forever. I'll want to full-time freelance forever. I think right now it's definitely the, the path I wanted to go on. I started full-time freelancing primarily because I fell in love with lettering and I was trying to figure out how I could do more of it on a daily basis. And I couldn't figure out how to get that in my day job. So I was like, well, I'll just make this my day job and I'll pursue it full, full time. Uh, maybe if I get the, the job opportunity from like the perfect agency, it's like, yo, you can letter 95% of your time here and we'll pay you X amount of money and you can like, we'll have whatever. I'm like, yo, okay, yes, I'll do this. I can have benefits again and I have to think about it. You know, yeah, there, there could be some benefits to it, but it's not, it's not necessarily end all be all for everyone. And I think that that's, it's important to know going into it. Like if I fail and using air quotes again, there too, a fail at this, then going to something else is not a total failure. It's just a different step in a different direction. Exactly. It sets you up to the next step. So do you have representation at the moment? Are you seeking that or are you just enjoying what you have right now and eventually might want to transition to that? No, I don't have representation representation right now. I was talking to Becca Clayson, who's a, a really talented stop motion tactile artist and she's talking with me more about representation and maybe it's something i'll consider i ha i don't know i'm still i'm i'm prideful and it's not that like i don't want other people to get me work it's just i i want to like go out there and do it and i'm like pretty driven the ownership and responsibility yeah. of things yeah i feel you it's not even about a percentage thing like i don't care if you take x amount of percent for my cut and you make sure i get paid but it's like yo i feel like i can go out here and i can do it and i can go get paid too so that's what i'm trying to do right now maybe if things change i will consider but i hear i hear both sides so it's nice to get a feel for that so how does attracting work or doing outreach or you know how does client onboarding pitching presenting and pricing go for you and do a lot of your clients attracted you because of your self-initiated side projects like your your flower dimensional lettering or projects like that or your food type yeah i do like pretty much no outreach the only outreach i do is like sometimes on twitter and like other stupid things i will every now and then if I really have a cool idea with a certain company, I'll reach out to them. I'll email someone and try to figure out if it's possible. Uh, I think only one of those has ever really worked out in my favor. It's not like it's, I don't believe in doing it. I just don't do it. Uh, my, my biggest source of like gathering client or getting work is just by doing personal projects. It's always cool to see like where they come from. Like I, I like to experiment and I'm always open with experimentations, especially through Instagram stories, something like I really have fun with. So I'll share my process and background, like do all kinds of things in Instagram stories. And it's cool when I get a project that like relates to something that I've definitely tried or done once before in the past. It shows there's like a clear connection between like the things that you play around with and the things that people are willing to hire you from. Sometimes people just have to see it to know that it's possible, right? Like a client may not know that you can build, you can make something out of flowers or, or that you can 
um, make something that looks like water on a surface and do lettering out of it. So it's like until they can see it, like, oh, he did a, a liquid type for something else. I wonder, can you make a different kind of liquid type for me? Those things like align later and you don't really know when they will or how they will. If you're full time freelance, now, how do you make time to pursue personal work? Do you schedule things? I guess, first off, what's your daily routine look like? So daily routine, I'm like up pretty, usually pretty early. I'm not a freelancer who sleeps in. Everyone thinks like, yo, you just like stay in till like 11. I'm an early bird too. So I get it. I'm up at six, six thirties most mornings. I usually hit the gym and come back and like answer some emails if necessary. And then, uh, so I have an office that's not too far from my house and I try to come three to four days a week from 10 to four. Like those are the hours I give myself, which is, I still work outside of those hours, but like those are the, the kind of working parameters I give myself. So because of that, because I try to like, I try to make sure I'm here three to four days a week and try to make sure I'm here from 10 to four ish when I'm not that busy, then I'm, I know I'm at my office and like, I'm, there are things around me and I'm like, Oh, well, I can just shoot something or I'll just create something or I'll just draw something. Uh, and that's how the, my personal projects kind of happen. Uh, they just happen in the time in which I force myself to be here, but I might not necessarily be as busy as I should be. So then kind of inspiration for something happens. You strike when the muse hits you then if yeah. you have that open gap of time. You're not just like scheduled planning. Okay, I know at 6 a.m. tomorrow I really want to dive into this uh, Pantone project again or flower photography or food type. So you just strike when the iron's hot. Yeah, for the most part. I mean, there are times in which I, I do, like I'll be here and like I'll say I come up with a cool idea and a cool concept and I'm like, I'll, I'll plan it out. And I know I need to shoot. I use a lot of natural light for my shots. So I was like, oh, I need to shoot it. I can't shoot it today because I'm going to run out of time. And I, Or maybe I need to go pick up flowers or pick up materials. So then I just kind of, I will schedule those things and I schedule them as if they're a client thing. So even if I have a, a client who calls me or wants to work with me or whatever, I'm like, well, I can't because I have a shoot tomorrow from 10 to, to 2 or whatever it is. Uh, and I treat it as if it was a real client thing on a real calendar. And that's totally like up to whatever the project may be. It's hard to say it happens every single time, but it, when it's a shoot based thing, sometimes it has to happen that way. You shared a story not too long ago about your laptop and car getting broke into, was it? Yeah, it was my house. Oh, my part. Your house, yeah. your house. Okay, yeah. I, I, I'm, I've been meaning to ask you or talk to you about this. You talk about the motto of keep your head up and handle it. Yeah. And I, I'm big on responding to adversity. And like you always have a choice, control what you can control. You know, what's kind of the backstory about this and what's the story behind it and, and how can people keep their head up and handle it when it's, you know, a creative and up apply this to their daily mindset of approach. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, two years ago, my apartment got broken into and literally, I was, at that point I hadn't started working into my office. So uh, my home was my office. So they literally took everything from me. And you just started freelance at this time. Yeah. Right? yeah. I, so this happened in October and I started freelancing. I completely was out of the agency by June or July of that year. So it had been a couple of months. And I got, remember I told you the savings account had to win like four months later. So this was like the end of the savings account. I was like, Oh, I'm like barely making it. Uh, really struggling to to get by. Uh, so apartment got broken into. They stole my MacBook, my iMac, my camera, and my iPad Pro, which is like everything that I use to make money. So luckily enough, my I like pulled some money together, and my dad helped me to be able to afford a laptop. I literally went into an Apple store and I bought like the cheapest MacBook Pro I could literally find. I had to take one home that day. It was funny because that was like right when Apple announced the new laptop with the Touch Bar. And the touch bar ones will be available in like two more weeks. And I went to the store and the guy was trying to upsell me. And I was like, dude, I, you don't understand. Like I have to take a laptop home today or otherwise I can't make another dime. And, and the touch bars, everybody hates that yeah. I talk to. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm like lucky to not have one, I guess. I big on music and I sink into music in the good times and the bad. And that was like a really down time for me when I was struggling. And I was like, maybe I got to go get a job again, uh, even though I wasn't really wanting to. But I, there was a Tupac song, and at the very end of it, he just says, like, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how tough, whatever, just keep your head up and handle it. I just really resonated with that, and I kept that motto, and I kept kind of living by that. And I realized that it's not necessarily the end of the world if you can't afford to get everything that you want to get back. These material things, they are just material things, but I needed them to work. It's okay if they don't all happen right away. They can happen one step at a time. They can happen over months or years, in my case. I mean... A year and a half after it was broken into, I replaced my iPad Pro. And then like two years and two months after everything 
was broken into. I finally replaced my camera. So it's like, I knew it didn't happen all at once. And it was all one big success story. Like, Oh, you know, you just buy it all back within a couple of days or a couple of months. Like, no, it takes time. Um, and I think that's like that, keep your head up and handle it kind of piece. Right. It's like, I didn't have my iPad. So I learned how to do things without my iPad. Right. And I didn't have my camera. So then I learned how to do things without my camera and borrowing cameras or using my iPhone or whatever it took. I mean, we're creatives and creativity is problem solving. Yeah. And being resourceful for what you have and what you have is enough at the time until you can upgrade. But so how does this how does this motto work with you every day, not just with uh, material things? Yeah, it's like no matter how how tough things actually are, you can you can get through it. You can get by it. I mean, you might need support. You might need help. Uh, don't be afraid to like enlist your friends or family or call for somebody on support. But I mean, we're we're all way tougher than we think we are. I think that that's uh, an amaz- amazing realization when you finally like come around to it. I mean, you're going to stress, but try not to stress as much about it. Cause there's some things you can't handle. Uh, and like when I was in kind of darker times, I, I practice mindfulness and things like that. And it kind of teaches you to just handle the, like take care of the things that you can like, you can actually control some things are outside of your control. Right. And it's like, it's impossible to do anything with, to do anything about so you can't really focus on those things. You can't try to control them because you trying to control them is going to stress you out even more. So just handle those things that you can take care of those, uh, those smaller things. And then the bigger picture will slowly be illuminated. And a lot of those times when we're taking bumps on the chin or we get knocked on our ass due to adversity, it's kind of just teaching us a lesson to set us up for something bigger. Yeah, for sure. At least I found that all a long time with me. So Something else. I, I highly respect you for this. You, you're not scared to use your voice. You're not scared to use your platform and skill set to use your voice to empower those who maybe don't have that same caliber of voice as you. You know, how important is it to to speak and create on behalf of those who don't have as big as a platform as you? And what are some example projects you've done this with? Or what are some examples of things you're working on now to kind of speak out and use your voice? Yeah, uh, I'm big on making everyone using their voice and using their platform in the best way that they can. Right. It's like everyone has a platform. That's what we always forget. We think that like in order to to speak out about anything or to, to, to use your voice, you have to have hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram or what a real stage in front of millions, whatever. That's not true. We all have an audience. We all have a following. It could be five people. It could be 500 people. It could be 5 million people. It doesn't matter. You can reach out and touch so many of those people who are listening to you. And it's actually it's funny. I know we talked about Creative South earlier. The first time I went to Creative South, which was in like 2014, I think. There's a guy, his name is Doc Weiler, and he was a speaker there. And I, I literally just like pulled up the blog post that I wrote about it. This was four five years ago now. And one of his quotes is, everyone gets heard, just trust that you have an audience. And this is something that like I really resonated with. So I always try to use whatever my audience is, uh, whatever reach I have to, to bring light to whatever issues that I feel are important. Right. And some people are nervous about this, especially as you gain more Instagram followers or you start to work for yourself. And it's like, well, OK, maybe I, I am personally not a Donald Trump fan. And then how does if I post something on my Instagram that, go, that fights against Donald Trump, how does that like speak to a client? Like, what if they don't like that? And it's like, well, if you and I don't align on certain things, then maybe we shouldn't work together anyway. That's OK. You can go find someone who more closely aligns with what you feel. Um, is in your best interest. And I can work with clients who believe in the things that I believe in. I think that's important to try to use my voice a little bit more consciously to talk about issues that I felt were important. Uh, And then one of those was about uh, highlighting black lettering artists. So I think this was uh, in 2018, early 2018, but I saw something that was about black people I can't even remember what it was exactly even. It's like funny how those things slip your mind quickly. But they they hired like a white lettering artist to do a piece. And it kind of, I was like, oh, it, kind of, it feels weird. Like we're doing a thing about black people with a white person, right? Like could could you not have found a black person to do it, right? And I've, I've always been big on this myself. I've gotten reached out to about, like there was a clothing company that wanted to do like a lettering piece for shirts. And they were like about, they were like a feminist based lettering or a feminist based company. And I was like, Oh, that's cool. I totally believe in this stuff that you believe in. And I align with this stuff, but does it make sense for me as a man to be doing something that's like made, made for women? Yeah. So like, I just sent back like five names and it's like, if you bet, if you go through your betting and you go through all these people, you don't necessarily like their work or, or whatever timing doesn't work, then come back to me. I'll happily work with you. Uh, I just want to make sure that I do my due diligence and I recommend what I can. So 
once that happened, I was like, oh, maybe they just couldn't find any black lettering artists. And I was like, wait, maybe I can't find any black lettering artists. So I started to like look for them. Uh, and I was like, oh, I follow like of the hundreds of people that I follow on Instagram, there were like four of them who were black. And I was like, that feels like that's a problem, right? Uh, so I just like simply reached out on my Instagram stories looking for more black lettering artists. And I was just overwhelmed by the response and people like sending me new names and new accounts. And I just started sharing those accounts. And they're still like on my same stories on Instagram. Do you have like maybe three off the top of your head that people right now could look up while they're listening? Oh, man. Uh, Simone Wilder is one of my favorite. Hers is Simon and Moose. There's a guy named um, Hust Wilson who is also really yes, incredible. I follow Hust. Yep. Oh, and there's another one. I think his name is Trey Seals. Um, his Instagram handle is vocal type. What I really love about his stuff, he's more of a type designer, less of a lettering artist, but whatever. The interchangeable. Yeah. yeah. He, um, he researches like historic typographic posters, especially related to black history and creates typefaces off of them. So like he would look at posters from the, the March on Washington and create a typeface based on the posters that were there. I just thought that was incredible. I know you're currently in the works of making a project in the meantime, yeah. mm-hmm. but you know, I, I think that's cool. Is there anything that we can expect or that you for sure are pursuing this more? Yeah. I mean, uh, my dream, the, the dream inc- like version of whatever this project is, is a way to like get more black lettering artists into the hands of more people, like get their work in the hands of more people. Um, if that doesn't necessarily pan out, which we're still working on pitching this idea, I will at least create some sort of resource some sort of like either blog post or website that at least gives us some sort of highlight to, to these black artists. So I know like there are other things around that exist, like people of craftsmanship by Tim Goodman. And I can't remember who else he created with, uh, where they, they highlight artists of color, um, of all kinds art, like artists, illustrators, designers, lettering artists, whatever. Uh, but this one's like very lettering specific because I'm a lettering artist. And I just thought it was important to talk with the people who do what I do. Well, Whenever you get something lined up, holler so we can project it out to everybody listening right now. Get in the show notes, whatever it is. And then give me recommendations of other future guests yeah. I can have on the show. So <laughs> keep it rolling. About it. Okay. Well, what's one piece of advice you'd give your past self when you were just starting out? And this might sound, I guess, a little counterintuitive, but I would probably tell myself to not look too far ahead. I don't know. I, I stress out sometimes, and this is me, like a personal thing for same. I give myself anxiety trying to work too far ahead and being in the moment. Like we create these lofty expectations for ourselves. And I think those can really start to beat you down. In 2018, I set some goals. And one of my goals was to make 20,000 more than I did last year, which is like 20,000 seems like a big number. And it's like a huge, I don't know, it's hard to digest. And I, although that was my 2018 goal, what I did is I just broke it down per month. And I said, like, I need to earn X amount per month in order to make this goal. And if I didn't make it that month, then I knew I could try to make it up the next month. And there's a little bit of back and forth that happens as a freelancer. So it was like, I had to take this huge lofty goal for myself, which isn't really that huge in my opinion. Um, and then chop it down to something that was more digestible that I didn't have to look too far ahead for. Right. Like I'm just only looking through like, January 1st to January 31st, can I make X amount of dollars? And then February 1st to February 28th, can I make X amount of dollars? That would get me, that would ladder up to that goal. Uh, and it's cool when you, like, when you, I didn't even stop to look at it. And then I got to like, I think I got to September or October. And I like stopped, went back and looked at some invoices and like calculated up. And I was like, oh, I've already made what I made last year. And then so I only still have 20,000 more before the end of the year in order to make. And then I, a couple of months later, I, I got to said goal. So, yeah, just to not think too far ahead. Try to keep it into like digestible chunks whenever possible. I like that. Yeah, that, that, that's perfect. Well, then what's one big goal you have in 2019? Because as this comes out, this is the end of January. And for your defense, we're recording, I believe, on like the 17th right now. So this is like the time you would be. So I don't know if you had something planned already. No, uh, I'm not 100% sure what, what 2019 goals are. But I know goal number one, I still always want to give myself a financial goal. Uh, the 20,000 of for last year, the 20,000 more in salary was because I did not make nearly enough in my first year and a half, my first six months freelancing, I didn't make hardly anything, right? I was losing money the next full year of it. I told myself it was like the piss or get off the pot thing, right? It's like, if I don't make this amount of money, then I need to just go get another job because this won't be sustainable. So that's what the 20,000 was. And so this year is one of the big goal is to make what I left at the agency. So I still have not yet made the salary that I left, 
which people think like, oh, you're balling, you're killing it, you're crushing it. Like, no, I'm still, still, still trying to, to make it through, but hopefully I will get there. And this year's goal, 2019's goal will be to make what I left off at the agency at. Well, let's not stress you out with this one then, because I'm big on thinking like five year plan. What's one big thing you want to accomplish in the next five years? And one big thing in the next five years. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, hmm. And this is so weird of me, but I've been wanting to do some sort of book. I know. I feel like everybody's creating books these days. And I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> That's all mine too. <laughs> I want to definitely create a book. I don't know exactly what book that like what form that takes quite yet i don't know but i don't think it's like a workshop book because i'm not really super workshoppy uh in terms of um what i do but i think that i think there's some knowledge of value that i have i've been teaching for the last two years now yeah where do you where do you teach real quick plug that too uh, i teach at DePaul university in chicago um, I, right now I teach lettering and then I teach typography and then sometimes I teach a course on illustrator. A lot of fun. You learn a lot about yourself when you start teaching, uh, <laughs> and about how shitty sometimes your own process is and how to like nail it down for other people. Like, Oh, I got to figure out what the hell I'm doing. Then I can tell you how to do it. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have a process if you don't write it down. <laughs> Not at all. So now I'm like, Oh, my lettering process is X, Y, Z. Like I can go one, two, three. Uh, through the through the steps, which is good uh, because I probably couldn't before. But I'm thinking like some of this information I could compile into a book because what I struggled with is like you know as an instructor you get to like choose what book they have to buy or or whatever. And I don't have a book. I, none of my classes have a required book for for um, the course. But I think about the things that like I want to teach them and share with them. I've not been able to find it all in one place. So it's like maybe I can write my own version of this. But we'll see. That's dope. That's dope. All right. I appreciate that. So rapid fire questions and I'll let you get back to the rest of your day. <laughs> if you were on death row, what would your last slice of pizza be? Okay. I, I live in Chicago now. I'm not a crazy fan of deep dish, but uh, there's a particular deep dish place, Pequod's. I would do um, with spinach and sausage. It's like, it's, it's, it's my jam. All right. So since we kind of had the hip hop theme with this, who's your favorite hip hop artist in the past? And who's your favorite hip hop artist currently? Oh man, past 100% Tupac. He's my boy. I listen to him like almost every day, and that's where that quote comes from. Uh, current, it's it's probably Kendrick Lamar, and of course, like on Tupac Butterfly, they, they had this like little uh, interview thing that happened between the two of them, which is fantastic. And that was like all of my dreams come true in one. So I know you did the the button set from We yeah, Gonna Be yeah. All Right. Too. Yeah, I kind of forgot yeah. about that. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm a hip hop. <laughs> Me junkie. too, man. I'm Me a hip hop junkie too. All right. Um, if you could have lunch with one person dead or alive, who would it be and why? Ooh, I'm still with my, my boy, Barry Obama, AKA Barack, you know, he and I are tight. That's why I call him Barry. Uh, <laughs> I've seen him live. I've seen him speak, I think three times now. And I swear every time I just like well up in tears and I don't even know what it is. It's like, God, this man has so much power over me and I've never even met him before. So, uh, if I can have he and his wife, the whole family shit, I just all together, we can all get together. I bet you he could bust the flow too. <laughs> oh, I know he could. I know he could. He knows what's up. <laughs> oh, I, I, I already know this one. At least I hope I know this one. Script Serif or Sans Serif? Oh, I mean, you know it's script, man. Always. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Some people surprise me or they're just like, I just want to switch it up. This one. All right. Murals, flower tactile, dimensional type, or creating products. What brings you the most joy and fulfillment? Uh, it's probably the tactile stuff, especially flowers. I've, I really have a love for flowers. I'm going to litter these show notes with a ton <laughs> of your work too and make sure I'm hitting all that stuff so people can sure see it. it. Okay. Where do you seek your inspiration online and offline? Mm, online, uh, I mean, of course, like through Instagram and Dribbble and Pinterest, like through sources like that. Um, a big source for, I've talked about this multiple times, but a big source for me in terms of inspiration are just my peers. And I like when my peers set the bar, like they, when they do something that's so fucking fantastic that I feel like I have to one up it, I have to top it. Uh, and like, that's where so much of my inspiration comes from. Like there's a designer from Chicago named Kyle Tinder. Yes, he was just on not too long ago. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, he's a, such an amazing guy, an amazing artist. And I, I, even though our work is like totally different in two different paths, every time he posts some shit, I'm always like, God, Kyle, that's good. And I got to figure out like what I'm going to do that's going to be even better. And I just kind of like that, that little bit of competitiveness that I have to treat everything with, that that's what inspires me to, to make better stuff. 
but then at the same time, it makes you compete with yourself to do better than you did before. Both of you guys make me question and scratch my head, like, what the hell am I doing in lettering stuff? Nah, dude, nah, nah, nah. You make us question that same thing. Like, this, it's just like a revolving, I don't know. It's like, we're all in the same thing. What about offline? Do you find it a lot through fitness? Uh, yeah, through through working out and staying healthy. And I, I, I find a lot of inspiration in just the city. I love Chicago. And like, I find myself like getting lost sometimes on bike rides or runs or just walking. And like looking at the signage and looking at all, like there's so much hand painted stuff here in Chicago still too. Uh, and that, that kind of just like, I don't know, that's where I get a lot of huge visual inspiration. That's awesome, man. Where can people go to follow you online and support you? Uh, everything is at Ade Hogue. So uh, at Ade Hogue on Instagram, Twitter, and whatever. Uh, and then my website, of course, is adehogue.com. So I mean, follow if you want. If you don't want to, that's cool too. Uh, who cares? <laughs> follow this dude. Follow this dude. And look at it for a, a conference near you speaking yeah. or possibly teaching. Coming up in March. Where at? Uh, I'll be in Raleigh, AIGA Raleigh. Okay, perfect. Is it Thrive Event or? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. I spoke there last year. It was dope. Oh, sweet. Dude, yeah, awesome. Taylor Cashin and uh, yeah, yeah. Lenny Lady. hooking you up. Uh-huh. You're doing uh-huh. awesome, yeah, man. Yeah. They're great. A day. Hey, thank dude. you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule. I know you're out there hustling, keeping yourself healthy and fit and providing all this value you do. We all sincerely appreciate your time. Keep crushing it, my man. Nah, you are you you out there. You, you providing things to the creative community. And I love it, Scotty. Well done. We love you. Appreciate you, brother. Take care. All right. All right, PC family, a day hope. A day has an incredible story and is overall a pretty incredible human. And I feel honored to have this talented soul be a part of this podcast journey. I highly recommend following on Instagram or support him by snagging some of his merch on his website, a day That's a D E H O G U E.com. And a day, I just sincerely appreciate how you show up by investing not only in your craft, but in the creative community as well. So thank you so much, and you know the drill. Go shower and pepper a day with some love if what he had to say made an impact on you today. Thanks again, a day. And if you've been enjoying what you hear and you want to support the growth of the show, here are a few ways that you can make it happen, Captain. And I've failed to mention this one for the longest time now. I don't know why it slips my mind, but if you want to financially support the growth of the show, you can back the podcast over at patreon.com slash perspective podcast. And another huge way to help is by subscribing and leaving a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. And not only does the subscribing part along with the rating and review help the show climb up the charts in the design category, but most importantly, it allows me to return the love by giving you a shout out as the listener of the week and get your name mentioned in the show notes and the newsletter. And of course, I am able to read international reviews now because this week's listener of the week is I am MK from Romania. And they title it one of the best podcasts there is. That's a bold statement, but I appreciate it. And they say, I came across Scotty's podcast not so long ago when I got hooked. It's fun and light, yet very professional, packed with tons of valuable info. Just like that, short and sweet, doesn't have to be anything crazy and allows me to give you some love. So again, if you're international, don't hold back, leave a review too. That way you can become a future listener of the week. Thank you again, and as I wrap things up, I want to give a huge shout out and thanks to my podcast editor, Anya Brennan, and my executive assistant, Paige Garland. I can't do what I do without you two ladies. And again, a huge thank you goes to Nick Jenkin of Bluka for all the dope theme music you hear on the show. Go and support his new album or his new EP, Foreign Objects. Listen and vibe out to everything at SoundCloud, Spotify, and connect with him at Instagram. That's Bluka, B-L-O-O-K-A-H. And as you finish off your week strong, I want to continue to encourage you to keep showing up, keep putting in the work, and keep creating. You got this.